And welcome. We are Laura Goldman and Elizabeth Shores, and we are very excited to have Karola Obermüller and Sarah Hennies joining us tonight for an evening at John Summers. Um, before I introduce Karola Obermüller, who will be introducing Sarah Hennies, we would like to thank the art department of the University of New Mexico, as well as art and ecology and the generous private donors for making this ongoing speaker series possible. Thank you. Throughout the talk, we encourage you to submit uh, written questions. Um, the location is at the bottom of your screen. By now, probably most of you are familiar with it. Um, and after the talk, we would invite you to come on camera and uh, speakers and, you know, um, talk directly to Sarah or Carol, Carola, um, which we found to be a lot nicer um, and more productive and interesting. Um, also, just as a note, we are recording um, this um, talk. Um, so just so that you are aware of that and if that's something you're not comfortable with, then don't turn on your camera, please. Um, so it is my pleasure now to um, introduce Carola Obermüller. Are you there, Carola? Yes, thank you. Um, Carola Obermüller. Um, after receiving her PhD at the, you know, at the Harvard University, which originally brought her to the US, she's now an assistant uh, professor of theory and composition here at the University of New Mexico. She also lives and works um, part of the time in Europe and has been a visiting artist at CKM, Deutsche Akademie, Rom, Centro Tedesco di Studi Veneziani, Akademie uh, Schloss uh, Solitude, and IRCAM, as well as serving as a resident composer for new musical festivals at the Hochschule für Musik Nürnberg, um, Conservatorio Piccini di Bari in Italy, uh, University Mozarteum Salzburg Festival Virtuosi Centuro, and then there's some Roman numbers, um, um, and uh, Recife in Brazil, Samubor Music Festival for Croatia and others, the list is, exponential, <laughs> um, but those were just a few um, to name. Um, her music, um, often political, always dramatic, includes operas for the Staatstheater Nuremberg, Theater Bielefeld, Theater Bonn, and Stuttgart's Musik der Jahrhunderte. Um, the emotional juxtaposition of stories suspended in a tableau architecture that one finds in her operas can be heard in her concerts works as well. Among the many commissions from numerous um, lauded contemporary music ensembles, as well as soloists, Carola is also the recipient of many awards, among them the just to just name a few again, um, the New York Musician Club Prize, um, the John Green Prize for Excellence in Music Composition, first prize for, of, for the new Note International Composer Composition, and many, many more. Um, having been selected for the com Contemporary Music Edition by the German Music Council, the Vergo label has produced a portrait CD of her music, which is already out, and, and then there's another portrait CD uh, for new Focus Records um, in production. So thank you, Carola, for being here with us tonight. Thank you, Lara. Thank you for the nice introduction. It's uh, my pleasure and my great honor to introduce Sarah Hennies to you. Um, and um, well, uh, depending on the time zone you're in, um, you know, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night. <laughs> um, so yeah, thank you for joining us. Um, and thank you to Lara and Elizabeth and the Somers Gallery for bringing Sarah Hennies um, that's very special. And um, yeah, I'm very excited to hear her talk about her work. So um, the first time um, I heard about Sarah was really when her um, um, maybe 
you know, most famous work came out in 2017, Contralto. And um, two friends of mine played um, in the world premiere, Wendy and Tim, and I know them from um, Boston. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a small world, but that's the first time um, um, she just popped right into, um, you know, the news I, I follow uh, the, in contemporary music. And there was a New York Times article written about her actually several. And so, um, yeah, it was um, really great to learn about her then. She was born in Louisville, Kentucky, and she's now based in upstate New York. And um, she's a professor at Bard College. So folks who want to study with her, go, you know, apply. Um, she's not only a composer, she also does improvisation and is involved with film and performance art. And of course, she's also a percussionist, um, often playing in her own works. Um, her work is concerned with a variety of um, musical and sociopolitical and psychological issues, um, including queer and trans identity, love, intimacy, and um, psychoacoustics, and of course, percussion. Being a percussionist, you can't get around that, being a composer and a percussionist. Um, her works are played um, internationally all over the place, and she also performs as a percussionist um, widely internationally. Um, she got a lot of um, commissions from different um, musicians and um, institutions. Um, and um, and her, as I already mentioned, her groundbreaking work in 2017, Contralto got a lot of press attention and was played all over the place. Um, I hope she will talk a little bit about that, but also others. She, um, Contralto explores trans feminine identity through elements of voice feminization to therapy. And it does feature a cast of transgender women, as well as a string quartet and three percussionists. It's a gorgeous score and video work. Uh, it was played in North America, Europe, Australia, etc. Um, Sarah has also been getting uh, grants, um, many of them. Um, some of the more recent ones, the 2019 Foundation for uh, Contemporary Arts Grants to Artists Award. She got a fellowship from the New York Foundation for the Arts. She got um, commission from New Music USA and so on and so on. Um, so, yeah, I'm really excited to learn more about her work, and I'm also equally excited to um, keeping following her and um, what she comes up with in, you know, the decades to come. So, thank you for joining us, and welcome, Sarah. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks, Carola, for the introduction, and... Uh, to Lara and the Summers Gallery for having me. I've been, I have several friends in uh, Albuquerque. I've been excited to uh, give this talk, even though I'm not physically there. I feel like I'm with my buddies uh, from Albuquerque. Um, so I'm going to take you through um, a lot of work, and I'm going to try to give enough attention to each one's. But um, it's roughly chronological, but I'll give you a very brief origin story that, that I like to frame things with. So um, as Carola said, I grew up in uh, Louisville, Kentucky, and I was lucky enough to be there at a time when the uh, DIY punk rock scene was um, just legendary. It was, it was a time when like bands wanted to move to Louisville just to be part of this scene. And I got my entrance into this was was really young at 13 years old. And it, it really changed my life. And my introduction, my entrance into experimental music was through the world of um, post-punk and post-hardcore music, and then eventually uh, DIY underground experimental music. So I really, as a teenager, learned so much and had a lot of foundational experiences um, really just from buying records and um, 
And eventually, um, you know, I went to music school as a percussionist, but as a composer, I never studied composition. And I really, uh, despite some, a couple of important experiences with uh, composition teachers in like a seminar setting, I really strongly identify as a self-taught composer. So I just like to mention that like, yeah, yes, I have a master's in percussion and I have somewhat accidentally found myself in a professor position at, at Bard um, through an invitation. And, and I really love teaching there, but I'm really kind of an accidental academic and I'm much more of a, um, uh, I feel at home at most in the sort of a DIY world of, of small shows and like hanging out with people. But anyway, let me um, get my, my slides going. So knowing that, um, I'll briefly tell you the thing, the things that happened that started me on the, uh, that started the body of work that I'm still involved with now, which started uh, a little over 10 years ago. And so I'm sure some of you know the composer Alvin Lucier, but uh, I, the, the text that you're seeing right now is most of the score for a 15 to 20 minute solo piece for triangle. Um, which triangle uh, is typically thought of really as more of a sound effect. It's a single use instrument. Um, and what Alvin Lucier's piece did is demonstrate that the triangle is actually capable of these really wild, beautiful, vibrant acoustic phenomena that we're just not paying attention to because of um, people's attitude towards percussion instruments and specifically small percussion instruments like the triangle that um, they're just not thought of as um, objects that have a lot of um, sonic potential. So I'll play you um, a brief clip of my recording of this from uh, 2009, and uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about it. So I'm in, I don't have, unfortunately, I don't have an, uh, an elegant way to stop these samples, so there'll be a lot of sudden stops. So I, I'm sorry about that. But um, here is uh, a little clip of, of my performance of this piece. So just from this brief clip, you can already hear that that the sound world here is is really really rich. When um, I think prior to people hearing this piece, their idea of the triangle is you hit it, it goes ding, and and that's the sound. Um, and so around the time that I uh, first played this piece, I I first heard of it in grad school, and I'd always wanted to play it, but I didn't play it until uh, 2008 on a concert of Lucier's music. And during that concert, someone told me about how uh, a lot of Alvin Lucier's music was the result of, of Alvin just sort of um, going down a path of pursuing his own sort of natural inclinations, like specific echoes were the specific example that was used that like a lot of Alvin Lucier's music is about echoes because Alvin just wants to know about them. He walks into a room and starts snapping his fingers. It's like this innate behavior. And so when I heard this, I was thinking about the work that I was making. And I uh, was making a lot of music at this time and had tried my hand at a lot of different approaches to making music. And I liked all of it, but I really, I had a sense that um, I was searching for something that would become like my work that I had not found yet. And when I heard this story about sort of innate desire 
I was thinking about that in terms of my own interests and I suddenly remembered uh, that I had written this piece as an undergraduate. And um, if you don't read music, basically the way that the score works is that you repeat this note many times for a few minutes. There's a pause, you play this one note, there's a longer pause, and then you repeat that same note over and over and over again for another couple of minutes, a little quieter, and the piece is over. And this piece was really just a, a, a really informal kind of brief experiment that I did where I noticed by really by accident this oddity about the vibraphone where if you strike it over and over and over again, it has this uh, really unpredictable change in sound that um, is caused by the construction of the instrument. So if, if you've seen a vibraphone, you know that it has uh, keys on the top that are arranged like the piano keys. And then underneath there are these tubes called resonators. And those resonators are closed on the bottom. They're not open. And so what happens is when you strike the vibraphone, air goes down into that tube. It bounces off the bottom and goes back up and bounces off the key again. And sometimes that sound wave hits the key on the bottom at the same moment that your mallet strikes the top and it causes it to go dead. And um, this is happening at, at an unpredictable uh, pace because the, of course the speed of the sound wave is not the, sp the same as the speed of your hand. And so um, the, this sounds like this. So all, all of that variation that you're hearing, it's subtle, but you can you can clearly hear that the sound is changing. All of that is happening on its own. The, the performer plays as regularly as possible and um, doesn't do any unusual playing technique. It's just striking a vibraphone. And when I was thinking about this question of what am I drawn to, I suddenly remembered that I had made this piece before I knew this Lucier triangle piece existed. And I realized that I was like, I already made this piece as a student that I had forgotten about. And so I thought that I should make more pieces like this. And so I uh, took other single percussion instruments, really just whatever was laying around my house and applied the same principle to them where um, I just played one note over and over and over again. And I gradually moved the mallet around different striking locations of the instrument. And what I found is sure enough, the same thing that happens with the triangle happens with other instruments um, where you strike it over and over and over again and you get these really wild three-dimensional acoustic resonances out of, again, these instruments that when we see them and hear them, we see a snare drum and we think, ah, yes, snare drum. And we all know the sound of a snare drum or uh, an extreme example, the, the page on the right, the wood block. You see a wood block and you know when you hit it, it goes <sniffs> But actually, and if we were in person, this would be the point at which I played you this piece, but of course I can't. So you'll have to take my word for it that the experience of hearing this wood block piece is absolutely un unreal. And when I made it, I was not expecting it to be like that, but it produces just, it's screamingly loud and it produces these wild high resonances and things happen where like you can move your mallet a quarter inch to the left and all of a sudden the sound just totally changes and when I made these pieces aside from being amazed at what happened acoustically and sonically I something clicked with me where I was like I this is it this is what I'm going to do and so I made a lot of pieces um, for uh, single sounds repeating over and over and over again. And, and this is another one of those. This, this is another piece for vibraphone that uh, sounds like this.
And so that, that piece goes on for, for 12 minutes and it's very simple. What, that one chord gets quieter and quieter and quieter over the course of the piece. And then the other player plays this kind of sparse thing and then eventually joins the chord at the end of the piece. And uh, one of the things that, that I did not expect when I made this is that um, over and over again, I got the comment, I've never heard a vibraphone sound like that before. And I was really surprised by this because, um, you know, I made this and the way that I'm playing the vibraphone here could not be more straightforward and simple and traditional. It's just a mallet striking a key. And yet for some reason, people are telling me that they didn't know that this instrument could sound like this. And what that tells me based on my experience with this piece and the ones I just showed you is that percussion instruments have this vast sonic potential that nobody is paying attention to because our preconceived notion of percussion instruments is that they're these like single use items that are um, sort of normal familiar sounds when in fact the, that they are not. And that gesture of simple thing actually is complicated um, and that actually I, what I found is I stopped making work like this because I found that I could do it with any sound. It works with anything, that absolutely any sound uh, is interesting and complicated if you just play it in a way that allows those interesting and complicated things to come out. And so I made a lot, a lot, a lot of work like this. And eventually um, I got a commission from a guitar player in Chile named Christian Alviar who asked me if um, I could write him a piece for guitar. And um, hopefully some of you out there read music, but I'll show you the score. Um, and so I got asked to write for guitar and I immediately, I was like, I, I cannot do the thing that I have been doing on the guitar. It just won't work. The guitar is quiet, it's plucked. Um, it's just a totally different kind of timbre. Um, and you know, percussion instruments are noises, uh, which are inherently um, acoustically very complicated. And the vibraphone is made of metal, which means it resonates in a chaotic way, but the guitar resonates in a very normal way. And so what I decided to try for this, and I'm sorry if you don't read music, but you can at least get a sense of what this is like, um, that I thought, what if I applied the same logic of repeating a single sound to instead repeating single patterns. And so what you have in this piece is just really, really short, slow patterns played over and over and over again. And it just goes from one thing to the next over the course of 45 minutes. And um, doing this piece opened me up to an entire new area of work for me that still feels totally tied um, to the other works that I just showed you. And it's, it's a completely different experience. It's not this like um, immersive, wild acoustic sound world, but there's something related there that, um, that I got really excited about. And so I set out to make more works like this. And I, um, most of these works are, are, are quite old for me now. And so I want, oh, this is the, um, cassette tape that was released of the piece I just showed you. But I'm really interested in talking about things I've made um, really recently in the past few years. And so I, and I'm really, I'm still working in this method now that I, instead of repeating sounds and repeating patterns, and I found that a lot of the same perceptual things are happening just in a different way where uh, I'm finding that listening to the second repeat of something is very different than listening to the 20th repeat of something. And that actually the way that we listen changes even though the music is not changing. And really that's just a different, a different setting of the same idea of a sound that is changing even though um, what the performer is doing is not changing. And so this, is, this image is the cover of an album that came out uh, in, uh, uh, last fall, and it, and it has two pieces on it. One is called Unsettled for vibraphone and piano, and one that I'll play you now is called Spectral Mouse Gonsities, uh for 
um, piano, contrabass, and drums, uh, percussion. And uh, as a sidebar, when, when I made this piece, I like, I'm continually surprised that nobody asks me what this title means. And, and I have done this enough times now that I have, I have uh, deduced a theory that the reason no one is asking me is that nobody wants to admit that they don't know what Melsconsides means, but it is in fact an entirely made up word. Um, I, I, had, I was writing this piece and I didn't know what to call it. And I had a dream one night that I had written a piece of music called Spectral Melsconsides. And I don't know why I had that dream. And I didn't know why I was, I didn't know exactly what I was doing with this piece. I just knew that I was doing it. And so I thought I would just give it that, that title. Um, and so this piece is in a similar vein, but much more playful and complicated. Um, I'll, uh, again, for the, for the music readers, I'll, um, I'll pull up a score. And so when you look at this, uh, a lot of people, when they see this, who know my music are like shocked that I wrote something uh, rhythmically complicated. But what you have is three players play all playing the same pitches. The drums are tuned to the same pitches as the bass and the piano. Um, but no one is ever in the same division of the beat. There is no discernible beat audibly. And you'll see down here at the bottom where it says repeat 20 times. And so what I, what I found is that, or what I thought was going to happen is that by giving these musicians really uh, technically challenging music to play and then asking them to play it 20 times was that would that it would, is that it would create this kind of complexity that I couldn't have written myself. That what I assumed would happen is that somewhere in those 20 repeats, the group would fall apart a little bit and then come back together. But what happened is that the group that I wrote this for is very, very talented and they played the piece perfectly. And then I uh, took that instruction about allowing mistakes out of the score. And now the, the version that I prefer is the perfect one. So um, here's what this music sounds like. And, and I'll pull up the score on, uh, that we're listening to on the screen. So I'll stop that there. Um, and, and that piece just kind of goes off on its own and it's about a half an hour long and um, eventually sort of fizzles out into this weird, awkward, very sparse ending. Um, but another piece in that vein, using the, 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 the very same approach uh, about this idea of, re of repeating patterns is uh, this one, which, this is also uh, an album that one can listen to that came out right around the same time in uh, October of last year. And there's a, a, a story about the creation of this piece. So in the last, I want to say five years, I think I've only made four pieces that I made just because I wanted to. I've been lucky to have a lot of commissions. And so most of my creative energy has gone into writing pieces for other people. But this one was an idea that I had had 
um, probably in 2016, I think, and um, that I was thinking again about this idea of um, things that I'm naturally drawn to and um, thinking about that in new ways because I'm making kind of a different kind of work now than I was when I first made work based on that idea. And I thought, well, one of the things that I seem to be drawn to is living with another person for a very long time. I, since 1998, I've had a 16 year relationship and a six year relationship with a six month gap in between. So, um, you know, I'm lucky to have found people that I can spend a long time with, but also it seems like something that I feel invested in doing. And one of the reasons that uh, I find long-term two-person relationship so powerful is that the longer you spend with that person, the more uh, there is this dynamic and bond that is created just through the fact that you've occupied the same space for a long time. And like, even if you don't like each other anymore, it doesn't even have to be a romantic partner. It could be, um, you know, a roommate or just someone that you live with. But um, this idea that the longer you live with someone, um, the more closeness, or closeness is the wrong word, but the more there's this unspoken dynamic about um, the way that you live together that can only develop over very, very long periods of time. And so I, I wanted to make a piece that was very, very long for two people. Uh, and also when you live with someone, I'm sure that you know that most of your lives consist of very mundane, mundane repetitive things like waking up, going to bed, going to work, coming home, making dinner, eating dinner, um, you, you know, all of these things, these really mundane things that we do every day that we don't think twice about because we do them all the time and they don't seem remarkable. Um, but then at the same time, our bodies are also governed by repetition of blinking, our heart beating, breathing, walking, and so forth. And I, as a person who makes music, a lot of music based on repetition, found this to be a really exciting idea for a piece. And I would have written this piece no matter what, but I got this call or this email one day from a duo called Two Way Street, who I did not know. And they wrote to me and they said, hello, we're Two Way Street. And we were wondering if we could commission a very long piece from you. And then I also realized that these two people were a couple and, and I just was shocked. I couldn't believe it that uh, it was like getting a phone call from God or something that, that a total stranger would call me and essentially ask me if I would write the exact piece that I wanted to write. And so sure enough, I um, wrote this piece that consists of, um, it's an hour and a half long for two people, and it consists of repetitions of, even if you don't read music, you can see that this is pretty mundane material. It's like one note repeated for four minutes, and then another two notes repeated for more minutes, Two note, one note repeated for three minutes and so on. And the piece just goes on and on and on like that. It's just this re repetition of really simple material. And um, the piece is peppered with these magical little things that happen. And I, com I compared it to someone, the experience of if you've ever been with your partner, just not doing anything, just sitting around, watching TV, eating dinner, whatever. And then all of a sudden, one of you just has this feeling and you look at the other one and you're just, and, and you say like, hey, how's it going? That, you know, there's this moment of like, of attraction that happens for no reason. And the reason that that's happening is the result of the time that has passed. And so this piece is peppered with all of these things that happen these little magical, like I keep referring to it as like a, like a third player. And so for instance, in the first measure here, um, actually, let, let me play it for you. Um, and 
And so one of the things that happened that I that I hadn't anticipated is that um, this cello note that after you listen to it long enough, it, to my ears, the sound of the of the note and the sound of the bow on the string start to kind of separate perceptually, and then it also it almost sounds like three things happening, and uh, that kind of thing happens throughout the piece. And I'll give you another example here. Um, that I have to skip somewhere in the middle here. Okay. Uh, we're hearing this right now. And so in this clip, you, it's hard for me to whistle this low, but you can hear this note that is, um, here, listen again. And no one is playing that pitch. It's happening entirely on its own. And, and I'm sure that that's happening for some uh, reason having to do with overtones um, in the cello part, but that wasn't something that I composed. It was something that I hadn't anticipated. And um, all of this seemingly like really normal material keeps producing all of these uh, kind of weird magical little things. And one last thing I'll say about this is that um, the performers through almost the entire piece are playing in different tempos. So this person is playing in 50 beats per minute and this person at 60 beats per minute. So even though this looks to be a synchronized score because they're playing at different speeds, you have this, this feeling that the players are together physically, but not playing together um, like synchronized in the way that most music is. And in fact, um, it's almost 40 minutes into this piece before they are truly together. And it stays like that for several minutes and then the piece just goes off onto its own thing again. And so the, this work, um, became, and actually I knew when I was making it, this this work is, is really, really special for me and my favorite thing that I've ever made. And the reason for that is that it just seems to tie together everything that I care about as a musician um, into one piece in, in this elegant statement about something that I feel really strongly about and feel like very, very tender about. And so, um, I'm really very, very proud of this piece. And it uses this same principle of um, something that seems to be repeating is actually changing uh, in part because like we are changing that the way that I hear something uh, three minutes from now is different from the way I hear it now and, and so forth. Um, I'm recognizing the time. So I want to, I don't wanna leave out uh, certain things so I'll just very quickly tell you um, about another project that I'm working on now called uh, The Reservoirs. And um, this is an album that came out, I think about a year ago. And what happened is that right around the same time from two different places, I got asked uh, to write pieces, one for piano and three percussionists uh, for my, my percussion trio called Meridian and one for a flute and a group of singers. And, I, th and I, I thought it was such a coincidence that I got asked right at the same time to write two pieces for one of something and a group of something that I thought, oh, well, this is a series that um, I was trying to decide. And oh, and I decided that I would make a third one that I'm actually working on. I'm in the early stages of working on now for string instruments. and. Um, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do with these pieces, but I was thinking about the piano as this kind of container with the percussionists scattered around it. And I was watching a documentary about the musician Nick Cave um, at night on a very long flight on an airplane. And I was like half asleep listening to this. And he used the phrase uh, reservoir of the unconscious. And when he uses this phrase, the, the film is kind of a like making of an album film. 
And then while they were making the film, Nick Cave's teenage son died in an accident. And so then the film becomes Nick Cave talking about and his wife talking about grief. And he used this phrase, reservoir of the unconscious, that I just, for whatever reason, just snapped up in my seat on the plane. And I looked it up later and I found out that actually this is a, a concept from Carl Jung and Sigmund Freud about um, they called human subconsciousness uh, a reservoir and specifically a reservoir for traumatic memories in that the human brain as a safety or as a protective mechanism files away traumatic experiences into the unconscious so that we don't have to keep re-experiencing re -experiencing them every day. And so I wrote this piece, um, I'll play you a clip of the second one, where the piano uh, representing the unconscious thought is this kind of um, almost subliminal presence where the piano just plays these very soft repeating pitches and the percussion parts are these very sort of active, dramatic, loud things. And what happens is that in a subtle way, the piano part absorbs these less aggressive aspects of the percussion piece and um, really a quite literal translation of this idea of, um, of, of memories being absorbed and stored in the, in, in the subconscious. And so that is the way that that piece was composed. And then the second one is for flute and singers, which I thought of as a different, to each piece is in the, and this is, these are not like solid psychological uh, things that I've researched. They're just things that I've observed about myself and other people about our association with our, our relationship with trauma. And so this one called Intrusion has musical aspects to it where these um, sort of weird like vocal like uh, sounds stick out of this otherwise very beautiful um, uh, soft gentle texture. And it's for singers who are walking around the space and uh, a flute seated in the middle of the floor who essentially just plays one note over and over for an hour. And uh, here's what that looks and sounds like. And I will say, this is an entirely acoustic piece. This is just voices and flute. So like I said, this piece is very long. Um, so obviously this is just a small sample of it, but you get a sense of um, what this is, what, what the piece is like just from this short clip. So uh, I, I wanna leave enough time for questions, but I have a, a couple more pieces to show you on, on a, a very different topic. Um, I'm gonna skip that one. So uh, as Carola mentioned in the, the introduction, I made this piece Contralto in 2017. And um, I, the, this piece is a, um, I'm very careful not to call it a film with a score. It, it's a piece of music with a film, which means to say it's not a traditional film score where the 
music is there to support the film, the music is an equal partner with the film. And the experience of seeing the live musicians is part of the piece because the, the parts, the piece is an hour long and the, the musicians parts are very, very physical and very exhausting. And so part of the piece is this image of um, these musicians just working so hard for so long. Um, and, and to me is, is an important part of the piece. So the way that this piece came about is that I, long before this piece was made, I just had this initial seed of an idea where I thought, wouldn't it be great to make a, a trans woman only space, a space that uh, no one else is in except trans women because that kind of space simply does not exist, doesn't exist. It, it, it just, will never happen. And well, for trans people, period, tra trans masculine or trans feminine people, that we are always going to be probably the only person in the room, which is very alienating. And also, um, uh, what's the word? It's very alienating, but it also gives you the sense that like the world is not for you. And so I wanted to create a world that is for us. And so I wasn't sure how to go about making this work. I just knew that I wanted to do that. And then I encountered these um, materials written by speech pathologists that were designed to teach trans women how to speak like cisgender women. And um, I'll just, as a quick aside, if, if you don't know this, when uh, often when a, a trans person decides to transition, they'll take uh, hormone medication and if you're a trans masculine person, you take testosterone. And one of the physical changes that that brings about is that it thickens your vocal cords and your voice changes, your voice drops. And it often doesn't drop much, but it drops usually into a range that will always be read by cisgender people as a male voice. But the opposite is not true with trans women. When you take estrogen, your voice stays the same. And to me, when I encountered this material, this like teaching material, I immediately was like, oh, this is how to make this piece. And um, maybe before I say anything else, uh, I'll just say that other, I didn't write a single word of dialogue in this piece. Everything that the people on screen do is generated from these vocal exercises except for one section of the piece where they um, are all responding to a question that um, the audience does not know what the question is. And we'll, we'll see um, part, part of that section here. Um, so this is a contralto. Go full screen, here we go.
feel sort of uneasy and I kind of tend not to talk about in detail with cis people unless I know them really well. Uh, I've been triggered by social situations or um, certain emotion situations. Um, sense of the world. I feel like ugly is not the word for it, but misfit. All right, I'll stop that there. So this was taken from about uh, two thirds of the way through uh, an, an uh, hour long piece. And there is uh, quite a lot of different ways that I could talk about this piece, but I, I realize the time is, is short and I'd like to show one more thing that is uh, an in-progress work, but the, the reason that I chose this material of voice is because the way that this is being taught most often, I think, is that speech pathologists have gathered uh, components of cisgender female speech, and then they're handing them to trans women and saying, now you try it. And what that creates is a situation where trans women are always less than because what they're asking us to do is not possible. It's just not possible. And when uh, Drea, the older woman in the pink sweater came to my house and uh, she had to, to do the film and she asked me what the piece was about. And I thought, I said, well, I think that the, the voice class is asking us to do something that's impossible. And she said, oh, oh yeah, definitely. And so, I, uh, I'm definitely in no way talking down to the practice of, of vocal training because I definitely understand why people would do that. And there's really, and I will say anything that I say broadly about trans people is not true for everyone. There's a vast spectrum of ways of one, uh, one could choose to uh, live their life as a trans person, but these are just things that I've noticed that affect um, most of us. And uh, I lost my train of thought <laughs> that, um, oh, right. There's two primary reasons for this. One is to be more comfortable because um, we often are not comfortable having lower voices because we are women and we would like to um, look and sound like women. But that is a little bit of a um, incorrect thing to say. But, oh, and the other one of these reasons is, is just safety. Uh, I saw a talk by a woman named Elise Barbara a, a few years ago, and she told this story about how she and her friend, also trans, were you know just sitting on the sidewalk, and she saw these drunk guys getting off a bus and walking towards them. And she, she thought immediately, she was like, what if these guys start talking to us, and they hear my voice, and they realize that I'm trans? Like, they could beat me up or kill me because that happens all the time. And so 
these are the two main reasons is comfort and safety. But what I found through taking this class is that prior to the class, in my mind, the thing that needed to happen is that we all needed to speak higher so that we could be comfortable and we could be safe. But in fact, this is incorrect. And in that really what needs to happen is that society's idea of what a quote woman sounds like is actually just incorrect and needs changing. Because if you believe that trans people exist, which they do, um, this idea of quote, what a woman sounds like is, is totally meaningless because what a woman sounds like is um, whatever that woman's voice sounds like. And so for me, it's like this quintessential uh, protest about um, how one, how society could go about treating trans people in, in a better way. Um, so I, I'm happy to take more questions about this work if people have it or about anything else, but I wanna show one more thing that I'm working on now and I'm very excited about it. And so um, it involves a, a little bit of a backstory. So some of you may have seen this documentary called Marwan Call that came out, I, I wanna say about 10 years ago. And it's about um, this person named Mark Hogenkamp, who's an artist in uh, the Hudson Valley. And his art, you can see here, he's a photographer and he creates these little miniature scenes of this um, epic war drama that takes place in the fictional world of Marwan Call. And um, the way that he was discovered as an artist, because he, uh, I hate the term outsider art, but this is not a person who was in the art world at all when he was discovered. And the way that he was discovered is that he has this kind of large military toy truck that has a rope attached to it that he uh, would pull down the road. And this photographer saw him multiple times doing this and finally one day uh, pulled over and asked him what he was doing and was asking him why he was dragging this toy around. And he told him the story that uh, several years earlier, he had been drunk in a bar uh, near closing time and was talking to this group of guys and had uh, confessed to them that he had this obsession with collecting and wearing high heel shoes. And what happened is that this, I, I think it was five men followed him out of the bar and uh, beat him nearly to death. Like he almost died. And he has no memory of his life prior to this event because he was hurt so badly uh, physically and um, mentally. And the reason that he started making art is because uh, as therapy, as, as physical therapy, because he found that, uh, or I'm sorry, his uh, insurance after a while stopped paying for his physical therapy. And so he developed his own therapies. So by working in miniature, it's, uh, it helped him improve his motor skills by doing you know fine things with his hand. And the dragging of the truck down the road was that he found if he could drag this truck down the road uh, in line with the white stripe on the side of the road, that that was also helping him uh, physically to regain some control of his body. And so I saw this documentary and was really moved by it uh, quite a long time ago, probably 10 years ago. And a few years ago, I was at a junk shop in Portland, Oregon called Really Good Stuff. And um, I didn't show it, but uh, uh, I have a lot of music made for these tiny little bells that I've just find all over the place for next to no money um, in like th th thrift stores and flea markets. And that, you know, once you, once you buy one, you've got to keep buying them because you've decided that you care about them. And um, part of that collection is that in this shop, I found this old metal toy that is like a train car or something, and it's got two bells on it. And when you roll it, there's a hammer that, that goes like this back and forth and rings the bells. And when I saw it, I thought, oh, bells, this is $7, I'll get it. And it was only uh, probably a couple of years later that I suddenly remembered the story about the toy truck um, and Mark Hogenkamp. And I, and I thought, oh, that's why I wanted to buy this. And so um, 
I, uh, I am teaching a class at Bard College right now called Queer Sound. And just last week we were talking about the composer Harry Parch who uh, kept describing himself as a musician that's been seduced into carpentry because he built his own instruments. And I'm very much a musician who's been seduced into filmmaking. Um, so I set out to make this film. Uh, my friend Josh Benetta here in Ithaca uh, shot the film for me. And the thing that I'm gonna show you is only a small early portion of a piece that'll be shot over the course of a year or so. Um, and here, I'll, I'll just play it for you. I'm not gonna play the whole thing, but it's about seven minutes long. And the music that you'll hear is um, a bass drum and vibraphone, but uh, there is a score that exists for woodwinds that I made for this piece uh, before I made the film that will eventually become the soundtrack.
right, I'm going to stop that there. And so I, I wanted to make this piece um, partially because I just found the image of this of this truck being dragged down the street so compelling on its own, but also the the high heel shoe is this to me this like symbol of um, stereotypical femininity that trans women are all expected to um, adhere to, and I personally would not be caught dead in high heels. And in fact, the video that you just saw is the first time I ever walked in high heels for the purposes of making this film. And that is the only time that I will ever do it. And I, um, there's this situation that trans women are placed in where we're expected to be hyper feminine and then we're criticized for being hyper feminine. But if we're not feminine enough, then people say that we don't look enough like women and it's, it's this impossible situation where um, we're never allowed to um, you know, look how we want, no matter how you look. And also just personally, I find it irritating that I feel this unspoken pressure from society to like wear shit that hurts my feet and I think are like, frankly, like kind of dumb and no offense if you like high heels, but um, that just the, the high heel shoe for me is the, is this sort of multifaceted image that um, seemed re really um, fruitful for the piece that I wanted to make. And uh, the last thing I'll say, and then I'll finish up, is that the title passing is, of course, refers to, um, you know, passing by, you're walking, you're passing by, but also passing is the, the term for uh, uh, a transgender person who's able to be seen who moves through the world being seen as cisgender, which is to pass. And so uh, it's this kind of double meaning. So that's it for me for now. It looks like we've I managed to finish in time for, for some questions, but thanks so much for listening and, and hopefully you found it interesting and uh, thanks for having me. Can you guys hear me? Can y'all hear me out there? Yeah. Yes. Sarah, thank you so much for this transcendent and beautiful talk. Um, we've been collecting some questions in the chat while you were speaking. Um, and at this time, we'll be inviting audience members to turn on their camera and um, uh, audio uh, to ask questions if they wish. Um, and while audience members are formulating their questions. I wanted to ask Sarah and Kaola, do you have any questions that you would like to ask one another at this time? Uh, I don't know. I feel like I just like uh, said a lot about myself. <laughs> so <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if, there, if, if I have more to mine right now. I am curious, um, Sarah to uh, know, do you work with someone when you do the film part or do you mostly do it by yourself? Uh, Contralto I made entirely by myself. I, um, when I got the New York Foundation of the Arts Fellowship um, in uh, 2016, I had already been thinking about Contralto the year earlier, but I was like, well, I don't have, a, I can't afford a camera so I can't make this piece. And it just kind of stayed in the back of my mind. And then, I won this fellowship and immediately I was like, I can buy a camera. And so I bought a, a you know, moderately nice DSLR. And I, I knew that I wanted the piece to just be people shot from here up. And I knew that I wanted it to be this sort of recurring order of people flashing on and off the screen. And I figured that that was simple enough that I could learn Adobe Premiere to the point that I could make that film and actually my friend Josh Bonetta, who was the one that shot uh, Passing for me, is the one who gave me like a 30 minute crash course in Premiere. And then, uh, but I made the piece entirely by myself other, other than a half hour uh, lesson in Premiere. <laughs> so you're not only a self-taught composer, you're also a self-taught film artist. That's amazing. Seemingly, but I like, I have occasionally been called a filmmaker and I feel like I have to be like, hold on a second. <laughs> like. I, I'm, I would not call myself a filmmaker despite having made a film. 
it seems a little unfair to filmmakers. <laughs> Um, I think we have a question from Eva. Eva, you could yeah. try that. There you are. <laughs> Hi, so my name is Eva, and um, I'm at, at UNM. Sarah, thank you so much. That was, that was really amazing. Um, uh, probably more, well, maybe it does have a, a, a bigger context, but, but things shifted after you started um, talking about Contralto. But your your work seems so akin to poetry with respect to experimentation and working with repetition, um, trusting the magical and more. Do you have a relationship with poetry, or are there any poets that that maybe influence you? I I really I don't. I am like a hardcore sound person. Like I you know I like films a lot, but I feel like the the only way I know how to work is is through sound. Um, and m pretty much all of my work comes from a place of like introspection and the only thing I seem to have inside of me is sound. And so, <laughs> and, and I actually, I just, I have a weird relationship with words. Like I, I really love a lot of like singer songwriter music of, of like folk singers. And, um, for me, words are like a bonus, like for me, the sound of a really good folk singer or like the sound of Bob Dylan or the sound of um, of, of like um, Shirley Collins is like the thing. It's why I'm interested in that kind of music. And for me, the if the really if the words are great, then then that's that's like a bonus for me. But I'm I really I don't know how to engage with art. Uh, I mean, that's an exaggeration, but th there's no other. Um, art that, that I think plays into what I'm doing. Are there any more questions out there? I mean, I would, I would have uh, one question just, um, how do you think about presence in your work? Um, both like in um, sonic terms and visual terms, how they um, add, differ, um, work together. And um, how is that also like, I mean, presence is something very poetic, but it's also something very political. And um, I was just wondering, like, how would you, what is presence for you? When is your work? Is that something that I, I guess I'm. You yeah, know. I, that that's something that I've thought about quite a lot in in a lot of different ways. I mean, the 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 most immediate political version of that is just trans women taking up any kind of public social space is a protest, um, which is sad that just by a trans woman being on stage is somehow a political act. It's like ridiculous, but it's true. But th that isn't the thing that most interests me. Like a great example is um, that piece Settle that I showed at the beginning of the talk is played with two people on either side of the vibraphone, but the one of the players doesn't play for the first three or four minutes of that piece. And that piece started to get played by a lot of percussion students. And I started to notice this, this thing that was happening sometimes where, um, the person that didn't play at the beginning would walk on stage when it was time for them to play. And it never occurred to me that anybody would do that. And when I saw it, I was like, that is so wrong. Because especially with percussion, like, I mean, all music is physical, but as far as like using your body, percussion is particularly body involved. And to me, like, the presence of that person standing there not doing something is such a huge part of that piece that that I really I had not thought about that until I saw it happen and um, added another layer of that piece to me and um, I mentioned in contralto part of part of a, a big part of that work is the presence of the live musicians of yeah. the endurance and physicality required to play that music or like I have this old piece, it's a 23 minute continuous snare drum roll 
uh, along with some very primitive electronics. And part of the experience of that piece is after a certain amount of time, the audience starts to wonder about you and that they start to think, when is this going to be over? Does this person's hands hurt? When do they get to stop doing it? And it becomes this kind of weird social experiment that on top of the music that at first hadn't occurred to me, it was only when a long time ago, someone commented how much they liked my stage presence. And I was like, what are you talking about? That, that it was just not something that I had thought about. And once someone commented on it, I realized that it was another aspect of performance that I needed to, to take care of um, because live performance is all about presence, of course. And so I really think when I'm playing myself, I think a lot about um, how I'm using my body and posture and what is the right way to do that for the piece that I'm playing. Just to like uh, jump on the back of that question, I was wondering about how um, your experience with your your working with the idea of presence has changed over the past year as a result of you know us all going into these sort of digital, um, I guess I want to call it a hole, but it's not really a hole. Um, but this it's sort kind of, of space, a hole. <laughs> yeah, it kind of is. Yeah, I, I, I have a, a somewhat boring answer to this question and that I just kind of like, I just don't feel like I can do what I do. Like, like everything that I do is about like intimacy and connection and, and immediacy. And um, I just find playing online really sad for me, which is not to say people shouldn't do it. And I am really happy that there has been this wellspring of, of online concerts for people uh, and I, you know, I don't mind watching them, but I, I find that I find them really sad to do because it just makes me miss the thing that I love doing. But I've also I've been lucky enough that I'm um, writing a lot for other people right now, and so I've had a place to put my creative energy without getting too depressed about not not performing. But it is really I'm kind of used to it now, but it's very weird for me because I've been playing music regularly for um, almost 30 years. And so this is the longest I think I've ever gone without playing a concert in my life since I was 13 years old, maybe younger, I'm not sure. But, um, and so it's really weird to not be doing that, but like I'm teaching and I'm writing a lot and we have a one and a half year old. So I'm just kind of tired all the time. Like, so I, I haven't um, gotten I've tried not to get too sad about it because I'm just exhausted all the time. Well, thank you, Sarah, so so much. And thank you, Carola. Um, it seems like we don't have any more questions right now. And so, yes, thank you to everyone for being part of this tonight. That was, that was just really, really uh, wonderful and, um, it was just really wonderful. So thank you, Sarah. <laughs> and um, yeah, we hope that you all enjoyed it as much as deep as we did. And so a good and nice evening to all of you. And maybe you want to join us for our next and last talk of the season with the artist Minerva Cuevas um, on April 15th, I think. And yeah, good night. Thank you. All right. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Lara. Bye-bye. All right. See, talk to you uh, some other time. <laughs> All right.